it's not only unbiblical, it's stupid. One of the worst doctrines, one of the worst teachings, and, and let me just say this, it's not only one of the worst teachings out there, it, this is really something that's really stupid. It's something that's easily um, debunked. It's something that easily is refuted. Why? Because it's simply not in the scripture. And that's this whole notion of this courtroom of heaven. And you keep hearing people talk about this courtroom of heaven, this courtroom of heaven. Just type it in, type it on any social media platform where there are videos, maybe Facebook, obviously YouTube, and maybe, I don't know, Instagram, I don't know how you do that on Instagram, maybe on X, uh, Twitter, Twix, maybe on uh, TikTok. But if you just type in courtroom of heaven, you can get all these different videos and people just making statements. And the fact is they make these things up. Is there anywhere in the Bible where this courtroom of heaven is? Well, no, there is not. Now, there are some phrases that we use that are in the Bible that are also similar to some phrases that we use in our courtroom. But this is not the same thing. There is no legal proceeding. There is no there is a judge but not the judge in the sense that we, that we go by, that we have, uh, where there's a bailiff, there's ways that you bring about an accusation, so forth, because we got we have an accuser, that means we have a prosecutor. We don't have a prosecutor, we have an accuser, someone that's always accusing us, and he uses other people. But I want to listen to some of these people who are making these statements, and one of the people that actually uh, kind of promotes this is someone who is just known to say stupid, kooky things, and that is Sid Roth. In the book of Job, it says that Satan shows up in heaven. Yeah, I've read that and I wondered about With that angels. too. angels. And I'm saying, Lord, there's something wrong here. Because Jesus tells us, I beheld Satan fall from heaven like lightning. We know he was cast out of heaven. I don't get it. Now, I want to go and look at something because th this isn't hard to, to, to get around either. We'll go back to more of what he's talking about. But let's just go and look at what he says in Job. In Job 1, 6, it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan also came among them. A couple things. One, there is question as to whether the sons of God, whether these are humans or these are angels. But let's just say it's angels. Does this necessarily mean that they were actually in heaven? Well, no. Uh, which which realm were they in? Were they in this atmosphere, this heaven, this Hashemayim, this part of the atmosphere? within outer space, within the third heaven, and which part of that, that heaven, we don't know. Uh, and so to say, well, I thought that Satan was at, well, no, if, if Satan wants to come come or have this conversation with the Lord, that's not something that's too difficult for us. Matter of fact, we can do the exact same thing. We can come before the Lord. Now, can a uh, an angelic being do the same thing? Well, apparently so. Doesn't tell us the place of it, but he's making a bigger point out of this that he should not. He's trying to be, say because this is an, an, an accuser, uh, because he is accused, then he's a prosecutor. And that's the reason why. And the reason why he's before God is there's this great courtroom that apparently God just stays in the whole day waiting for accusations and waiting for an attorney because there's this legal proceeding that must take place. By the way, this man is some apostle. I'm not sure what his name is. It's not even important. He's someone that you should never listen to. Why is Lucifer in heaven? Somebody must be fired at the borders of heaven or let this guy cross over. You know, why are you? <laughs> I was expecting God to say, Satan, what are you doing here? Instead, the Lord does not ask Satan what he's doing there in heaven. He asked him, where on earth have you been? Which means God is seeming to acknowledge that Satan's presence was legal. I just. They want to use this phrase the legal. But again, you will not find them using scriptures or at least using scriptures accurately. Just didn't get it. So one day God said to me, Francis, I know this is the theological quagma for you, but it's really simple. Yes, Satan was cast out of heaven. He has no residency here anymore, but he has been given a temporary access to one aspect of the kingdom of God, the courts of heaven, because how can we have a trial if the prosecutor is not seated? Jesus. Now, a couple of things. First of all, there is no trial. And by the way, they will always get their rationale from God speaking to them or somebody else speaking to them, not from the scriptures. But there is no trial. There is no how do you plead. And we can kind of play around with it. I've done it before, but there is. But I'm not making a doctrine out of it. There really is a courtroom of heaven. How do you plead? Here are the charges. You got a chance to look over the charges. Uh, we're going to accept a, accept a plea deal. We've got witnesses. No. Uh, no. Uh, when the Bible says that there is a great accuser, the one that accuses the brethren, it's not as though that he is going to go with you 
when you go before the Lord and stand on the other side and say, here are the list of charges. That is not how this works. This is not like what you see on Matlock or Perry Mason or the practice or law and order or any of these places like that. That's not what you see. It's these people who have this infantile, this sophomore, this childish understanding, and they apply their own selfishness, their, their disregard for the scriptures, their twisting of the scriptures or lack thereof, and add it to some make-believe notion that there is this, in this case, a courtroom of heaven. Jesus can't bring accusations against you. You only want an accuser. He has been given access to the court of heaven until the age of sin comes to an end. Those that aren't familiar with it, would you briefly explain? Now, he's also Sid Roth, because it's what he does. He's also going to ask someone else. This guy, I forget the guy's name, something Henderson, who is, he is as kooky as they come as well. He's also there on Sid Roth answering this question about the courtroom of heaven. Now, he actually brings up a text. We're going to look at that text. What the courts of heaven are. The courts of heaven is a spiritual dimension that we by faith step into. We by faith take God at his word and step into that realm. The best way I know to explain it is this way. Jesus, when he taught on prayer, he put it in three realms, approaching God as Father, as friend, and as judge. We know what it is to come before him as Father, most of us. We know what it is maybe even to approach him as our friend, because he is our friend. But then in the book of Luke, in ver uh, chapter 18, he actually said that we could come before God in his judicial system, because Jesus talked about a woman who came before him. Now, I want you to think about what he said come to him in this judicial system. Sometimes you see things and because you see something, you think that's the way that God has set it up. But how God wants us to see it is how he tells us God. Doesn't leave us here trying to figure things out. Otherwise, we would have kooks like this person or Sid Roth, by the way, his name is Robert Henderson. Uh, kooks like them who would come up and, and tell us this imaginary uh, way that they see things. Tell us this is how it actually is. An unjust judge and through her persistent presentation of her case she got a verdict and the the issue is if, if this woman could get a verdict from an unjust judge Jesus point was how much more can we come before God the judge of all and see him render verdicts in our behalf but now before we go and listen more to him of what he's got to say let's go to Luke chapter 18 and notice what he says this is Jesus speaking he says in a certain city there was a judge who did not fear God and did not respect the man there was a widow in the city and she kept coming to him saying give me legal protection so because he's bringing up this this legal protection or and they're being a judge then he thinks that this is how it is in heaven for a while there was an unwitting he was unwilling but afterwards he he said to himself even though i do not fear god nor respect man yet because this widow bothers me i will give her legal protection otherwise by continually coming, she will wear me out. And the Lord said, hear what the unrighteous judge says. Now will not God bring about justice for his elect who cry out to him day and night? I tell you that he will bring about justice for them quickly. However, when the son of man comes, he will, will he find faith on earth? And so if you want to use every little word that's used there, every um, person or character and say, this also applies to heaven, well, then who's the widow? Who's the who's the widow in heaven? Who are all the different things that are used in this story to tell this story? Who are who, who's there? Who are the brothers that are in heaven? The reason why he's telling the story is trying to he's trying to give a point that if an unjust judge is going to is going to rule in your favor because you keep coming to and pleading, then how would an actual judge, the true judge, the just judge, not one that's sitting in some courtroom with robes and a gaffle? That's his point. Jesus is making a, a different point that you ought to be con constantly coming to him. Like he says in Luke uh, about the the one who says, friend, I, I've got a friend who come out of come from out of town and he goes to his friend from bread for bread. And he says, Jesus response, same same story, same situation uh, that because of his persistence. And so he says, seek and you shall find. And so the same point is here. And that's the point to the level of faith that you are going to have. That's all he's saying. Now, I want you to listen to what this guy is saying. Uh, this guy, Robert Henderson, who, who is a, he, he's a prosperity preacher. He's about money, but he's also about inflating himself. Listen to this bogus story that he's telling. But as in the days of Joshua, the high priest in Zechariah chapter three, when he was a defendant because he had on unclean garments, he had on unclean turban, all these kind of things. And the enemy was accusing him because of the uncleanness that he had on, that whenever he was cleaned up as a result of angelic 
intervention, but also prophetic intervention. When he was clean up, cleaned up and new garments and, and a new turban, a fresh turban was put on him. Here's what it says, that God said to him in Zechariah 3, I think it's verse 7, that if you'll walk before me, Okay, if you'll obey me and do everything I'm telling you to do, he said, I will let you be judge of my house. Now, let's be clear what he's saying here. And this is in, in Zechariah 3. And, and he's praying and he's shown, he's shown in a vision uh, Joshua the high priest standing before the angel of the Lord and stand and Satan standing at his right hand to accuse him. Uh, the Lord said, now, by the way, this is not judgment day. Uh, and the, the Lord said to Satan, the Lord rebuke you, Satan. Indeed, the Lord was chosen. I'm sorry, the Lord who has chosen Jerusalem rebuke you. Is this not a brand plucked from the fire? Now Joshua was clothed with filthy garments and standing before the angel. He spoke and said to those who were standing before him, saying, remove the filthy garments from him again. And he said to him, see, I've taken uh, your iniquity away from you and will clothe you with festal robes. Now, he's not, now, by the way, notice how he used these, the, the words uh, he, that he was a defendant. Now he's making him into a judge. Is he saying, is the Lord saying that I will judge, allow you to judge uh, in my house? Yes, but not in heaven. This is not a, the point. The point is about him judging in Israel, leading his people. So let's continue. And have charge of my courts. Okay, well, what, what am I saying? I'm saying he actually moved from being a defendant to being a judge. And I'm here to tell you that if we're going to see the ultimate purposes of God accomplished, we are going to have to be, to be able to move from being a defendant. In other words, just constantly on trial and constantly trying to get words against us dismissed and all this kind of thing to being a judge that, that can operate with God and as a part of the court system of heaven. This now, by the way, how come we never see this terminology used in the New Testament when the church is founded? Now, we see this, uh, th this term, we have actual judges. Matter of fact, we have a book called Judges. But the reason for this is because of the dispensation that they are in, and this is under the old covenant. These are people that are trying to be led by God, and they have this leader. But what are we told? We're going to have a just judge, one true judge, who will lead us, and now we have that now. We're not looking for any judges. The reason why we don't have this, these words or anything like that brought up. Now, they use these words, courts and so forth, because there are certain passages in the Old Testament. Oh, I see this word, and so this word must mean the same thing then as it does now. For example... Psalm 104, enter into his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. This word for courts is the word katser, which is the word court, you're the courtyard or opening or open space or village. That's all it means. Uh, we can have a court in our house or in our yard, the courtyard. We have that. It doesn't mean like it's a, an actual legal building where there's metal detectors and there's guards to let you in and there's an audience and there's a jury pool and so forth. That is not what we have, but you see these words, and like a child, they'll take these words and run with them. It, this is this is stupid, and the fact that people are actually listening to this stuff and buying it up, they're portraying something that the Bible doesn't portray. They are literally bringing us a different gospel. To see God's ultimate desire for breakthrough come, which is the reclaiming of nations. But I want you to see this. The thing that started the court... Now, I want you to listen to how he comes up with this, really where he gets this from. Okay, that started the court from uh, into a place of operation was thrones, plural, being set in the place or seats being set in the place. See, what am I talking about? Here's what I'm talking about, that literally, literally, there are seats and thrones that are set into place, that there are those who have qual been qualified. Now, the question about these thrones and seats that are set in place and those who qualified, he's going to say that he's one of them. Where do you get this from? Where, where is this foolish notion found? Is it Where in the scriptures is it found? He's going to tell us it's not found in the scriptures. By God and have qualified themselves to sit in these thrones. I have, by the way, I have a dear friend, Anna Warner, and I don't think she would mind me sharing this. And she t tells me, she said one of the reasons she loves the court of heaven and she loves the court of heaven teaching and that we have done things together is that Anna Warner as a prophet was caught up into this dimension. 
And she saw these thrones. She saw these seats. And here's what she saw. There were many of them that were empty. There were many. So we're getting this from, not from God, not from the Bible, but from some prophet or a false prophet who said that, I guess she was shown this by God. And oh, by the way, he says the same thing, that he was also shown something by God. So we're not getting it from the Bible at all. We're getting, we're getting, we're getting it secondhand from someone who told him that they were told this by God. And so now he's living this out. Many of them that were empty, that no one was sitting in them. And she said this to me. She said, some of them, no one was sitting in. And this was crazy. She said, some of them, no one was sitting in because the people who had been in them had retired. They had. So we've got retired judges. I don't know. Maybe they had a, a term that ran his court. I don't know. But we've got retired judges. Had retired, and therefore they had removed themselves from the seat, uh, from the throne that they were to be sitting in. Because, because, please know me, uh, or see what it's saying. It says that God is the Ancient of Days, sits upon His throne. Which now, notice what He says. Says, see what it says. What it says. Well, there is no it says because there's no part in the Bible that makes this point out. You're getting this from this woman. And he's wanting us to take this from scripture and listen to what he says in just a second so we can see where, no, let's put the Bible aside. This is just from her, but we should take it. We should treat this as what he's saying, which was told to him by this woman. We should take this as scripture. Which is his throne, the throne of God. But then surrounding or as a part of his throne, there are multiple other thrones. Well, some of the seats, she said, were empty and it was stopping the court from operating on its higher level. Because if unless we can have the right ones sitting in the seats who have qualified to sit there. Okay, then we cannot have the court operating on the level that it needs to operate. Now, he says, unless the right people are there in these seats, then the court, this courtroom of heaven will not be able to function. How really how blasphemous and again, how absolutely stupid is this? And if you're listening to this, God help you. Okay, so God wants the ones that have been called, commissioned, and approved by him to take their seats in those places. And it was interesting to me that she said the reason that some of them were empty was because the ones who were ordained by God to sit in them, watch this, the Bible, or she said as a... She said, the Bible said, I'm sorry, she said, because again... This is where we're getting it from. We're not getting it from the Bible. We're getting it from some woman. Watch this. The Bible, or the, she said as a seer that they had retired. Well, here's what you need to understand. I literally was, 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 was slipping into a retirement mode. And the Lord gave me a dream. And the Lord said, I didn't call you to retire. I didn't call you to quit. And in fact, I saw in the dream that if I persisted down this way, that literally I was not going to live to the fullness of my days. What? So he was, he's going to die. God's going to kill you. If you don't take your role, because I need you to be a judge. We don't have enough judges to the benches. And so you don't have the president. Uh, we're always trying to appoint, appoint judges to the federal bench. There's a lack of judges to fill all the vacancies. And so we need you in heaven. We need, we absolutely need this moron in heaven to come fill this fictitious vacancy of this imaginary courtroom of heaven. That God needs you. That God needs you. So we've got the judge and we've got you, um, I guess, I forget, I guess he's a chief justice judge and you guys are just. Uh, associate justices. You are associate judges. This is silly. And we see different forms of this showing up. As a matter of fact, when you talk about these things such as this uh, generational curses, well, it's a different spin on this courtroom of heaven, but it's still just as ignorant. That it's just not found in the Bible. This makes absolutely no sense, and you can't find scriptural rep representation of this. What is a generational curse? Well, a generational curse or a curse is a warranted verdict given by the courtroom of heaven against a person, a household, a place that committed a transgression that warrants that level of penalty. But let it would be nice if there were a scripture to accompany this, but unfortunately, 
there is no scripture, so we'll just make it up and hope that no one decides to go search for this stuff, which is why Paul says, in first, and we keep using this passage, we're going to wear the ink off of this text. He says, I have figuratively applied to myself and Apollos for your sake so that you, so that in us you may learn not to exceed what is written. And he says also, the rest of that, he says, uh, so that none of you will become arrogant in behalf of one against another. When we see people saying, well, I am, I am, I'm called to do this. And, and so we got to trust this person. And that person just has this, their head swells, their, their ego swells because people are coming to them actually eating up this stuff. But these are the foolish people. You have to literally be a foolish believer. And again, listen, it's okay. Uh, there are Christians who uh, are still growing, who don't understand these things and they're being taken advantage of. But shame on you if you've been a Christian for some time and you don't know this. I'm not saying you're not saved, but then again. You can be saved and stupid. Tweet that. You can be saved and stupid. Thank you, Michael, because that's true. There are some people that are saved and stupid, and you have to be stupid to listen to this kind of foolishness when you know there are no scriptures to back this up. Now let me just start off, first start off by saying that not every sin produces a generational curse unto death. Let me give you an example of how this works. If me and my argument had a, if me and my wife had an argument, and the rapture happened, trust me, me and my wife will be arguing our way to heaven. <laughs> yeah, because arguing with my wife doesn't warrant a generational curse. But if I commit adultery on my wife, and the rapture might happen, and I'm caught in the middle of adultery, well. Now, this isn't making sense. First of all, what who where do we get this determination of which of what things are going to cause a generational curse? By the way, if you're being raptured, then then what's the point of the generational curse? This is why your argument is just absolutely fallacious and silly. It's just ignorant. It is childish. Now we're talking about the different degrees of penalty. This is why even in our uh, constitution you have robbery in the first degree robbery in the second degree robbery in the third degree the same is with the courtroom of heaven so yeah wow. so the demon and the curse are not the same but the curse originates from the courtroom of heaven it's the courtroom of heaven producing a verdict against a family a place a territory a company because that group of people or the individual has committed a sin that warrants that level of penalty and consequence. Mm, that is so good. No, it's not so good. And the fact that you said, mm, that is so good. There are people that you can literally tell them anything and whatever you say, as long as you kind of make it sound spiritual, mm, that's wow, awesome, that's deep, that's great. My, 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 look at the Lord. Well, think about this. And here's, let, let's just go ahead and nullify this with one particular verse. Let's go to the scriptures and let's just see if there's even, matter of fact, let's just see if we should even, if we should worry about these generational curses or about this courtroom of heaven or any of these things like that, something about, about someone bringing a charge against us. Well, the Bible literally says that. What then shall we say? This is Romans 831. If God is for us, who's against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? In other words, why would he, why would he go through all those things and, other, and then just to see us fail or fall? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Let that just sit in your soul for just a minute. Who will bring a charge against God's elect? Hmm. Nobody. Not even Satan, even though he's the great accuser. Why? Who will bring a charge against God's elect? God is the one who justifies. He has justified us. Who is the one who condemns? Christ Jesus uh, is he who died, rather who was raised. And so, and by the way, who also intercedes for us. There is nowhere, no place, nobody that can do anything to us or bring a charge against us. And so this imaginary courtroom of heaven that is going to bring down charges against us. Well, wait a second. He's not going to bring charges against us. He's justified us. Can Satan bring charges against us? Can he say some things? He can say what he wants to say. He can say and do what he wants, just like anyone else can say and do what they want to. There are no generational curses. It's a stupid, dumb, um, ignorant doctrine. It's not found. And I say that I'm not trying to be mean or ugly, but it's not in the scripture. And something like that can hurt people to cause them to think that I love the Lord. I'm saved, but I'm under a curse. That makes absolutely no sense. And then this person saying that I'm a judge. Listen to me. And I'm only become a judge because some woman 
heard from from God, not verifiable, and it's not in the scriptures. And so therefore, I am charged to help run the kingdom of God down here on earth. Uh, if you listen to these people, the old saying, you, you, you kind of get what you deserve. Whatever you get from following these people, you absolutely deserve. I pray you don't. I pray you open up and follow the scriptures. The time, though, uh, will come when people not endure sound doctrine. That time is here. And they just want to hear something, something profound, something deep. You want to hear something profound, something deep. If you want to listen to something and say, wow, that's good, read the Bible. Let that be your guide. Amen. Amen.